This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Hightower. A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 10 Champion and Chief. Early the next morning I was astir. Considerable freedom was allowed me, as Sola had informed me that so long as I did not attempt to leave the city I was free to go and come as I pleased. She had warned me, however, against venturing forth unarmed, as this city, like all other deserted metropolises of an ancient Martian civilization, was peopled by the great white apes of my second day's adventure. In advising me that I must not leave the boundaries of the city, Sola had explained that Wula would prevent this anyway should I attempt it, and she warned me most urgently not to arouse his fierce nature by ignoring his warnings should I venture too close to the forbidden territory. His nature was such, she said, that he would bring me back into the city dead or alive should I persist in opposing him. Preferably dead, she added. On this morning I had chosen a new street to explore when suddenly I found myself at the limits of the city. Before me were low hills pierced by narrow and inviting ravines. I longed to explore the country before me, and like the pioneer stock from which I sprang, to view what the landscape beyond the encircling hills might disclose from the summits which shut out my view. It also occurred to me that this would prove an excellent opportunity to test the qualities of Wula. I was convinced that the brute loved me. I had seen more evidences of affection in him than in any other Martian animal, man or beast, and I was sure that the gratitude for the acts that had twice saved his life would more than outweigh his loyalty to the duty imposed upon him by cruel and loveless masters. As I approached the boundary line, Wula ran anxiously before me and thrust his body against my legs. His expression was pleading rather than ferocious, nor did he bear his great tusks or utter his fearful guttural warnings. Denied the friendship and companionship of my kind, I had developed considerable affection for Wula and Sola, for the normal earthly man must have some outlet for his natural affections, and so I decided upon an appeal to a like instinct in this great brute, sure that I would not be disappointed. I had never petted nor fondled him, but now I sat upon the ground, and putting my arms around his heavy neck I stroked and coaxed him, talking in my newly acquired Martian tongue as I would have to my hound at home as I would have talked to any other friend among the lower animals. His response to my manifestation of affection was remarkable to a degree. He stretched his great mouth to its full width, bearing the entire expanse of his upper rows of tusks and wrinkling his snout until his great eyes were almost hidden by the folds of flesh. If you have ever seen a collie smile, you may have some idea of Wula's facial distortion. He threw himself upon his back and fairly wallowed at my feet, jumped up and sprang upon me, rolling me upon the ground by his great weight, then wriggling and squirming around me like a playful puppy presenting its back for the petting it craves. I could not resist the ludicrousness of the spectacle, and holding my sides I rocked back and forth in the first laughter which had passed my lips in many days, the first, in fact, since the morning Powell had left camp when his horse, long unused, had precipitately and unexpectedly bucked him off head foremost into a pot of frijoles. My laughter frightened Wula. His antics ceased, and he crawled pitifully toward me, poking his ugly head far into my lap. And then I remember what laughter signified on Mars. Torture, suffering, death. Quieting myself, I rubbed the poor old fellow's head and back, talked to him for a few minutes, and then, in an authoritative tone, commanded him to follow me, and arising, started for the hills. There was no further question of authority between us. Wula was my devoted slave from that moment hence, and I his only and undisputed master. My walk to the hills occupied but a few minutes, and I found nothing of particular interest to reward me. Numerous brilliantly colored and strangely formed wild flowers dotted the ravines, and from the summit of the first hill I saw still other hills stretching off toward the north, and rising, one range above another, until lost in mountains of quite respectable dimensions though I afterward found that only a few peaks on all Mars exceed 4,000 feet in height, the suggestion of magnitude was merely relative. My morning's walk had been large with importance to me, for it had resulted in a perfect understanding with Wula, upon whom Tars Tarkas relied for my safe keeping. I now knew that while theoretically a prisoner I was virtually free, 
and I hastened to regain the city limits before the defection of Wula could be discovered by his erstwhile masters. The adventure decided me never again to leave the limits of my prescribed stamping grounds until I was ready to venture forth for good and all, as it would certainly result in a curtailment of my liberties, as well as the probable death of Wula, were we to be discovered. On regaining the plaza, I had my third glimpse of the captive girl. She was standing with her guards before the entrance to the audience chamber, and as I approached she gave me one haughty glance and turned her back full upon me. The act was so womanly, so earthly womanly, that though it stung my pride it also warmed my heart with a feeling of companionship. It was good to know that someone else on Mars beside myself had a human instinct of a civilized order, even though the manifestation of them was so painful and mortifying. Had a green Martian woman desired to show dislike or contempt, she would in all likelihood have done it with a sword thrust or a movement of her trigger finger. But as their sentiments are mostly atrophied, it would have required a serious injury to have aroused such passions in them. Sola, let me add, was an exception. I never saw her perform a cruel or uncouth act, or fail in uniform kindliness and good nature. She was indeed, as her fellow Martian had said of her, an atavism a dear and precious reversion to a former type of loved and loving ancestor. Seeing that the prisoner seemed the center of attraction, I halted to view the proceedings. I had not long to wait, for presently Lorquas Tomel and his retinue of chieftains approached the building and, signing the guards to follow with the prisoner, entered the audience chamber. Realizing that I was a somewhat favored character, and also convinced that the warriors did not know of my proficiency in their language, as I had pleaded with Sola to keep this a secret on the grounds that I did not wish to be forced to talk with the men until I had perfectly mastered the Martian tongue, I chanced an attempt to enter the audience chamber and listen to the proceedings. The council squatted upon the steps of the rostrum, while below them stood the prisoner and her two cards. I saw that one of the women was Sarkoja, and thus understood how she had been present at the hearing of the preceding day, the results of which she had reported to the occupants of our dormitory last night. Her attitude toward the captive was most harsh and brutal. When she held her, she sunk her rudimentary nails into the poor girl's flesh, or twisted her arm in a most painful manner. When it was necessary to move from one spot to another, she either jerked her roughly or pushed her headlong before her. She seemed to be venting upon this poor defenseless creature all the hatred, cruelty, ferocity, and spite of her nine hundred years, backed by unguessable ages of fierce and brutal ancestors. The other woman was less cruel because she was entirely indifferent. If the prisoner had been left to her alone, and fortunately she was at night, she would have received no harsh treatment, nor by the same token would she have received any attention at all. As Lorquas Tomel raised his eyes to address the prisoner, they fell on me, and he turned to Tars Tarkas with a word, a gesture of impatience. Tars Tarkas made some reply which I could not catch, but which caused Lorquas Tomel to smile, after which they paid no further attention to me. "'What is your name?' asked Lorquas Tomel, addressing the prisoner. "'Deja Thoris, daughter of Mors Kajak of Helium.' "'And the nature of your expedition?' he continued. It was purely a scientific research party sent out by my father's father, the Jeddak of Helium, to rechart the air currents and to take atmospheric density tests, replied the fair prisoner in a low, well-modulated voice. We were unprepared for battle, she continued, as we were on a peaceful mission, as our banners and the colors of our craft denoted. The work we were doing was as much in your interests as in ours, for you know full well that were it not for our labors and the fruits of our scientific operations, there would not be enough air or water on Mars to support a single human life. For ages we have maintained that the air and water supply at practically the same point without an appreciable loss, and we have done this in the face of the brutal and ignorant interference of your green men. Why, oh why, will you not learn to live in amity with your fellows? Must you ever go on down the ages to your final extinction but little above the plane of the dumb brutes that serve you? A people without written language, without art, without homes, without love. The victim of eons of the horrible community idea. Owning everything in common, even to your women and children, has resulted in your owning nothing in common. You hate each other as you hate all else except yourselves. Come back to the ways of our common ancestors. Come back to the light of kindliness and fellowship. The way is open to you. You will find the hands of the red men stretched out to aid you. Together we may do still more to regenerate our dying planet. The granddaughter of the greatest and mightiest of the red Jeddaks has asked you. 
Will you come? Lorquest Tomel and the warrior sat looking silently and intently at the young woman for several moments before she had ceased speaking. What was passing in their minds no man may know, but that they were moved I truly believe, and if one man high among them had been strong enough to rise above custom, that movement would have marked a new and mighty era for Mars. I saw Tars Tarkas rise to speak, and on his face was such an expression as I had never seen upon the countenance of a green Martian warrior. It bespoke an inward and mighty battle with self, with heredity, with age-old custom. And as he opened his mouth to speak, a look almost of benignity, of kindliness, momentarily lighted up his fierce and terrible countenance. What words of moment were to have fallen from his lips were never spoken, as just then a young warrior, evidently sensing the trend of thought among the older men, leapt down from the steps of the rostrum, and striking the frail captive a powerful blow across the face which felled her to the floor, placed his foot upon her prostrate form, and turning toward the assembled council broke into peals of horrid, mirthless laughter. For an instant I thought Tars Tarkas would strike him dead, nor did the aspect of Lorquas Tomal augur any too favorably for the brute. But the mood passed, their old selves reasserted their ascendancy, and they smiled. It was portentous, however, that they did not laugh aloud, for the brute's act constituted a side-splitting witticism according to the ethics which rule green Martian humor. That I have taken moments to write down a part of what occurred as that blow fell does not signify that I remained inactive for any such length of time. I think I must have sensed something of what was coming, for I realize now that I was crouched as for a spring as I saw the blow aimed at her beautiful, upturned, pleading face, and ere the hand descended I was halfway across the hall. Scarcely had his hideous laugh rang out but once when I was upon him. The brute was twelve feet in height and armed to the teeth, but I believed that I could have accounted for the whole roomful in the terrific intensity of my rage. Springing upward, I struck him full in the face as he turned at my warning cry, and then as he drew his short sword I drew mine, and sprang up again upon his breast, hooking one leg over the butt of his pistol, and grasping one of the huge tusks with my left hand, while I delivered blow after blow upon his enormous chest. He could not use his short sword to advantage because I was too close to him, nor could he draw his pistol, which he attempted to do in direct opposition to Martian custom, which says that you may not fight a fellow warrior in private combat with any other than the weapon with which you are attacked. In fact, he could do nothing but make a wild and futile attempt to dislodge me. With all his immense bulk, he was little if any stronger than I, and it was but the matter of a moment or two before he sank, bleeding and lifeless, to the floor. Deja Thoris had raised herself upon one elbow and was watching the battle with wide, staring eyes. When I had regained my feet, I raised her in my arms and bore her to one of the benches at the side of the room. Again, no Martian interfered with me, and tearing a piece of silk from my cape, I endeavored to staunch the flow of blood from her nostrils. I was soon successful, as her injuries amounted to little more than an ordinary nosebleed, and when she could speak, she placed her hand upon my arm and, looking up into my eyes, said, why did you do it? You who refused me even friendly recognition in the first hour of my peril. And now you risk your life and kill one of your companions for my sake. I cannot understand. What strange manner of man are you that you consort with the green men, though your form is that of my race, while your color is a little darker than that of the white ape? Tell me, are you human, or are you more than human? It's a strange tale, I replied. Too long to attempt to tell you now, and one which I so much doubt the credibility of myself that I fear to hope that others will believe it. Suffice it for the present that I am your friend, and so far as our captors will permit, your protector and your servant. Then you too are a prisoner? But why then those arms and the regalia of a Tharkian chieftain? What is your name? Where your country? Yes, Deja Thoris, I too am a prisoner. My name is John Carter, and I claim Virginia, one of the United States of America, Earth, as my home. But why I am permitted to wear arms I do not know, nor was I aware that my regalia was that of a chieftain. We were interrupted at this juncture by the approach of one of the warriors, bearing arms, accoutrements, and ornaments, and in a flash one of her questions was answered, and a puzzle cleared up for me. I saw that the body of my dead antagonist had been stripped, and I read in the menacing yet respectful attitude of the warrior who had brought me these trophies of the kill the same demeanor as that evinced by the other who had brought me my original equipment. 
and now for the first time I realized that my blow, on the occasion of my first battle in the audience chamber, had resulted in the death of my adversary. The reason for the whole attitude displayed toward me was now apparent. I had won my spurs, so to speak, and in the crude justice which always marks Martian dealings, and which, among other things, has caused me to call her the planet of paradoxes, I was accorded the honors due a conqueror, the trappings and the position of the man I killed. In truth, I was a Martian chieftain, and this I learned later was the cause of my great freedom and my toleration in the audience chamber. As I had turned to receive the dead warrior's chattels, I had noticed that Tars Tarkas and several others had pushed forward toward us, and the eyes of the former rested upon me in a most quizzical manner. Finally he addressed me. You speak the tongue of Barsoom quite readily for one who was deaf and dumb to us a few short days ago. Where did you learn it, John Carter? You yourself are responsible, Tars Tarkas, I replied in that you furnished me with an instructress of remarkable ability. I have to thank Sola for my learning. She has done well, he answered. But your education in other respects needs considerable polish. Do you know what your unprecedented temerity would have cost you had you failed to kill either of the two chieftains whose medal you now wear? I presume that that one whom I had failed to kill would have killed me, I answered, smiling. No, you are wrong. Only in the last extremity of self-defense would a Martian warrior kill a prisoner. We like to save them for other purposes. And his face bespoke possibilities that were not pleasant to dwell upon. But one thing can save you now, he continued. Should you, in recognition of your remarkable valor, ferocity, and prowess, be considered by Tal Hajus as worthy of his service, you may be taken into the community and become a full-fledged Tharkian. Until we reach the headquarters of Talhajus, it is the will of Lorquas Tomel that you be accorded the respect that your acts have earned you. You will be treated by us as a Tharkian chieftain, but you must not forget that every chief who ranks you is responsible for your safe delivery to our mighty and most ferocious ruler. I am done. I hear you, Tars Tarkas, I answered. As you know, I am not of Barsoom. Your ways are not my ways, and I can only act in the future as I have in the past in accordance with the dictates of my conscience and guided by the standards of mine own people. If you will leave me alone, I will go in peace, but if not, let the individual Barsoomians with whom I must deal either respect my rights as a stranger among you, or take whatever consequences may befall. Of one thing let us be sure. Whatever may be your ultimate intentions toward this unfortunate young woman, whoever would offer her injury or insult in the future must figure on making a full accounting to me. I understand that you belittle all sentiments of generosity and kindliness, but I do not, and I can convince your most doughty warrior that these characteristics are not incompatible with an ability to fight. Ordinarily I am not given to long speeches, nor ever before had I descended to bombast, but I had guessed at the keynote which would strike an answering chord in the breasts of the green Martians. Nor was I wrong, for my harangue evidently deeply impressed them, and their attitude toward me thereafter was still further respectful. Tars Tarkas himself seemed pleased with my reply, but his only comment was more or less enigmatical. And I think I know Tal Tajus, Jeddak of Thark. I now turned my attention to Deja Thoris, and assisting her to her feet, I turned with her toward the exit, ignoring her hovering guardian harpies as well as the inquiring glances of the chieftains. Was I not now a chieftain also? Well, then, I would assume the responsibilities of one. They did not molest us, and so Deja Thoris, Princess of Helium, and John Carter, gentleman of Virginia, followed by the faithful Woola, passed through utter silence from the audience chamber of Lorquas Tomel, jed among the Tharks of Barsoom. End of chapter 10